Hello info person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the recent discoveries in regards to multicellular life and specifically some of the new ideas in regards to the origin of multicellular life or for essentially why life one day became super complex and started to create creatures containing trillions of cells. And yeah, I'm looking at you right there, you and your 37 trillion cells. And today we're going to focus on a few new studies that basically present us with some really intriguing examples and somewhat intriguing experiments that hint at how and why life became multicellular sometimes in the last billion years. But I guess first let's start with some of the facts and something that we already know based on previous research from the last few decades. And here it's really in regards to differences in cells. Today we mostly divide cells into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And though there's a third group known as archaea, for this video, they don't really matter as much. And well, when it comes to most life on the planet, today we know that when it comes to multicellularity, or basically complex life containing multiple cells, it usually seems to be prevalent in eukaryotes and not prokaryotes, not bacteria. And so basically, all animals, all plants and all fungi that do become multicellular are all eukaryotes. And though some eukaryotes can be single cell, or even partially multicellular, such as for example social amoeba that sometimes can create larger structures, or slime molds that are technically a single cell containing multiple nuclei and structures inside, for the most part this complexity is still mostly unique to eukaryotic life or to basically life containing cells similar to ours. And today we know that this idea of complex multicellular organisms seems to have evolved completely independently in six different eukaryotic organisms. Here we're talking about animals, brown algae, red algae, green algae, land plants, and fungi. Whereas in contrast, for prokaryotes, or for basically simple cells, bacterial cells, even though some complexity is possible and colonial organisms do exist, is just a lot less common. Although based on studies like this, we know that this complexity tried to establish itself multiple times. As a matter of fact, according to the study, at least 50 times in history of life, different types of prokaryotes try to basically create multicellular morphologies. But only eukaryotes succeeded at creating something like us. But in order to understand how and why this happened, we actually do have to study bacterial life and specifically different types of these complex prokaryotes that managed to establish something, because in that sense it then shows us why the complexity did not become more pronounced and why we don't really see some kind of a massive animal made entirely out of bacteria walking around. Or just to rephrase this, we know that some bacterial cells did actually achieve multicellularity to some extent. Such as for example photosynthetic cyanobacteria that's existed on the planet for billions of years and is known for dividing certain labor into two different types of cells. One is meant for photosynthesis and one is meant for fixing nitrogen. But still, we don't really see some kind of a massive cyanobacterial animal that can perform anything more complex. And so the question is of course, why? Why is it that we don't have bacteria containing different types of cells working together and organizing into something way more complex with trillions of cells? Now bacteria, as we've discussed in some of the previous videos in the description, can form what's known as a biofilm, which in some sense is, I guess, a complex shape, but it's nothing compared to what you have inside your body. And here there are obviously a lot of explanations and a lot of propositions, but only some of them have actual evidence. And let's actually start with maybe one of the more interesting experiments conducted in the last few years. Here this once again involved algae. And it's based on a study by William Crockett and the team right here that was released in 2024. And while well, here this particular study potentially presents us with the explanation for why multicellular life even evolved and gives us some hints on why so much life became so complex at a very specific period of time. Basically here this is a kind of a origin hypothesis. Now some of the previous propositions suggested that maybe by being multicellular life can survive easier and maybe even avoid predation. Or basically by bundling up it becomes easier to survive someone that's trying to eat you. But this study focused on our favorite topic, climate change. And specifically the extreme climate change that happened several times and that we know happened around the same time when we had this sudden explosion of complex life that seemed to have happened in just a few million years. During this time earth was different. It was the snowball earth. And for some reason at that time life suddenly became super complex in a relatively short period of time with multicellularity advancing extremely fast. And here the hypothesis suggests that during this time 
Even the water itself, the salty water, was actually a little bit different. And this is based on the fact that seawater, as it gets colder, actually becomes a little bit more viscous. And for small single cellular life, this is a bit of a problem. Basically here, for anything that's single cellular, moving through this water becomes like moving through honey. It becomes very challenging, and anything that's too small essentially gets stuck in it, unable to move. And according to this hypothesis, by forming larger groups, suddenly a lot of cyanobacteria that contained flagella was actually able to move much faster and much more efficient by producing much greater force. And so here this was essentially a survival mechanic. Some of the early cells, by combining together, started to move faster, with some of the larger congregations very likely becoming even more efficient and eventually kind of getting stuck together. And though this is obviously just a hypothesis, here this was actually confirmed through an experiment. You can read about this in one of the articles by Quantum Magazine, but most importantly, you can actually see the pictures and the videos. Here, by taking green algae that's known to use flagellum for swimming, and by using cold salty water, researchers were able to form larger congregates, or I guess larger colonies, by placing these algae inside gel-like conditions. And though individual cells had trouble swimming, once they combined into larger structures, they were able to swim as you see right here. But more importantly, when they took these cells and placed them back in regular water, they actually maintained the structure and did not separate for at least 100 generations. In other words, here they were able to simulate formation of multicellular life, or at least simple multicellular life, by changing climatic conditions to be somewhat similar to what it was like hundreds of millions of years ago. Which is a really intriguing experiment and a very intriguing proposition that possibly explains why a lot of complex life seems to have formed during the period known as the Snowball Earth. In essence, it could have been because the oceans were just a little bit more viscous. But here this obviously does not form a stable structure. And this is where additional research tries to explain this as well. Because based on a lot of genetic research, we now understand that a lot of multicellular structures and even formation of multicellular structures seems to be actually entirely viral in nature. For example, in order to fuse cells and form tissue, most animals seem to use a lot of viral mechanisms. Likewise, a lot of communication between cells, especially communication when it comes to the growth of the organism, also seems to involve many proteins that seem to have come from various viruses. With the implication from these studies basically being that, during this period, some of the cells basically got infected by various viruses that caused a dramatic mutation inside various cells, which essentially led to the formation of some of the first tissues, possibly forming some of the first animals. And so most of the machinery involved in multicellular structures seems to be viral in nature. We've actually discussed these concepts in some of the previous videos, because as we know today, up to 7% of all human DNA seems to be also viral in nature. The video about this should be in the description. But some of the other new discoveries actually did come from bacteria after all. And specifically one type of a bacteria that seems to only survive when they group together as if they were actually a multicellular organism. Now in prokaryotes or bacteria, this is actually super rare. Because most bacteria can easily survive alone and only come together when it's beneficial. But not so long ago, scientists discovered a very bizarre bacterium, often referred to as MMB, multicellular magnetotactic bacteria, that seems to only survive when there are other cells around. Which in some sense technically contradicts some of the things I said in the beginning, because at least one bacterium out there seems to be almost entirely multicellular too, but it's obviously not as complex. And so here, in one of the recent studies, researchers learned something else about it. Now, first of all, these unusual magnetotactic bacteria are very important in a lot of different biological fields, including astrobiology. And they're actually known for producing magnetic nanoparticles that then get oriented toward the magnetic field. In a lot of geological research, this is actually one of the ways we often know which way the magnetic field was pointed at certain periods on planet Earth. But there's also a very unique type of magnetotactic bacteria known as MMB. And it seems to live in a very unique way. First of all here, it seems to use these magnetic particles for navigation. These unusual magnetosomes act like tiny compasses, and they often allow these bacteria to know exactly how to orient themselves, which then increases their survivability. But what makes these bacteria unique is the structure they form. They're essentially always composed of multiple cells, anywhere from 15 to 86 cells, arranged in the way you see right here. And so by bunching up into a collection of cells, they essentially created a very unique niche. But here it's not just a collection of cells that came together, they actually seem to live and survive only as a bunch of cells. 
In other words, it's actually the only example of bacteria as a kind of a obligate multicellular life. They cannot survive alone. And so instead, they seem to act as a single organism and even divide as if they were a single organism as well. Basically, whenever they have to divide, they double the number of cells and then split into two identical pieces. And this is entirely different from every other known bacteria. So for example, in cyanobacteria, they can also form multiple colonies. Unlike these bacteria, they can actually live alone and can even separate and then form their own colonies far away. But in this case, these MMBs cannot do this. If you take out one of the cells, it basically just dies. And so extremely recently, George Schabel and the team you see right here discovered something else unusual about these bacteria, helping us understand them a little bit more. Here they discovered that each of these cells is not genetically identical as it was actually thought. As a matter of fact, each cell seems to be different and has a slightly different genetic material and also provides slightly different function inside this bowl. Or in other words, each of them is kind of complementary and seems to kind of mimic an individual organ in an organism. Some cells are better at one thing, other cells are better at other things. And this is actually a really bizarre discovery because it seems to show us a very unusual similarity between a typical animal and a bacterium that managed to form something similar with each cell contributing in their own way. In other words, here we have a really interesting example of bacteria that almost became an animal. And a bacteria that developed just as much complexity as a typical animal life, but just not complex enough. And this is of course a super important discovery for biologists, especially biologists trying to figure out life on other planets. Here this can help astrobiologists to figure out if this is something that can happen elsewhere. It can also help us answer questions about the evolution of life on Earth, but most importantly by trying to identify main differences between this and I guess typical animal life, we can finally figure out why we exist and why for bacteria this seems to be as complex as it gets. This is actually known as the clonal multicellularity. And here this is an example where cells remain connected as each of them divides, which is basically what happens in complex animals. Now, as I mentioned, this also happens in filamental cyanobacteria, but cyanobacteria can survive alone. And so definitely some really intriguing discoveries and intriguing propositions, but no exact answer yet. Basically here we have these individual pieces of evidence, but nothing connected them into a whole story yet. But it's probably because of discoveries like this that one day we'll be able to finally figure out why eukaryotes became so complex, why a lot of plant, fungi, and animal life became so ridiculously complex and so successful, and of course figure out if this can happen elsewhere on a different planet. But until we get new answers, I guess that's all I wanted to mention. Check out the studies, the links, and additional videos in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.